forgiveness sets you free that the enemy Amen. now can't hold you into that bondage or soul seeds of, of bitterness because he's always going to try to use guilt and shame and condemnation to keep you in that space so you can't be utilized by god the fullest of your potential so right. the enemy is going to call us by our sin the enemy is going to call us by our past whether the enemy is going to call us by our mistakes or our shortcoming god is going to call us by name <laughs> god is going to call us his children god is going to remind us that we're overcomers that we're more than conquerors and that's why it's important that i tell people we have to have the word written on the tablets of our heart we have to have it in us and we have to Amen. have the scripture memorized because when those when our identity comes under attack and it's going to happen and we're reminded of that thing from yesterday we have to be able to say that's something that happened to me that's not who i am that may have been something i did but that's not what i am anymore because i know whose i am and i know who has set me free from those things amen Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Rooted in Christ podcast. My name is Eric Stevens. I'm the founder of Redwood Christian Ministries. Hope everyone out there is doing well today. With me on the show is husband, father, pastor, author, Mark Sowersby. Brother, how are you doing? I am well. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast today. It's an honor to be with you and your guests. All right. So you're in, by the time this airs, we'll probably be in a different season weather-wise. So are you getting this Arctic blast that Cleveland has been getting, or are you getting spring? I'm just curious. Oh, no, we're getting Arctic blast. I am a New Englander, 100% through and through. I say Ka and Avid Yad, you know, but we do have a little bit of our heart in Ohio. We spent a season there a few years. So, you know, I, I learned to say, go Buckeyes, you know, so, so that's what I like there. So, And that's how you get back on the show. That's exactly you back on the show. <laughs> I Thank think you. when I was in when I was in Ohio, I learned there was a state up north. I was never allowed to say the name of it. We just called it the land up north. I know it started with an M, and that's about as close as I could get to say the name. Most people would chase me out of town if I said the whole name completely. So I, I learned there was a rivalry in college sports like I never saw before for that short season I lived there. And I learned to again put on that Ohio State. Uh, colors and say go just tell me you meant minnesota you'll be okay uh tell me minnesota. Minnesota. they're probably not gonna fall for that believe me so thank you for joining us i know i have you for a little bit of time today so i just wanted you just to to dive into just your testimony and just some of the things that god is currently using you to do today sure you know i think everybody has a testimony and my testimony is what the story of what god's brought me through like all our testimonies are and I hope today that all our testimonies bring glory to God. My testimony I call forgiving the nightmare. From the ages of 7 to 14, I was horribly abused by my mother's husband. Uh, he beat me, raped me, stabbed me, sold me to others, and just had his way with me in every way, shape, or form. It was an ugly time. It was a, a sad time. I was neglected. I was just rejected in every way. I was bullied at school, abused at home. And these seven years, without getting too much into the details, was just a, a time where I was empty. A lot of people ask me how I felt, what was going through me. I felt anger. I felt mad. I felt all the things other people felt, but probably I just felt empty. I got numb because the abuse was just daily. From seven years old to 14, every day, in one shape or another, I was being abused. I was being raped. I was being beaten. I was being stabbed. And this was just the the, this is how the oxygen that I lived in. This was the atmosphere that I knew. I didn't know any other way. And it, it kind of consumed me as it, of course it would. It was a horrible and abusive way to get brought up. I was also dealing with some special ed needs. I wasn't a great student. I, I had dyslexia. So again, another outcast in the school and academics. So all this kind of just made me feel ugly, broken. It made me feel lost. It made me feel insecure and fearful. But mostly it just made me feel numb. I tell people a lot of times I survived my childhood. I wasn't raised. I learned how to duck, not raise my hand. Thank you for your your transparency and, and sharing that. So what was your relationship like with your mother at that time? Like, was she aware? Did she know? Was she also being abused herself to whatever degree you want to dive into sure. that? Sure. I think the best way to look at my story is you kind of have to look back a season. You know, when I was coming up, Things like abuse and neglect and addiction were things that people didn't talk about outside the home. Right. The generation my mom came from, they kind of prided themselves 
on saying, you know, we keep our dirty laundry at home. We don't let anybody know. Unfortunately, that's kind of the situation I grew up in. Today, I'm so thankful for awareness and support and advocacy that's out there. So when people are being abused, when people are victims, when there are there when there is tragedy, there's resources to find help. But the generation I came up was again, I'm on the other side of 50. So we're going back to late 70s, early 80s. So our home was on the outside looked good. You know, we had the plastic smile. We kind of knew what, which way we were going. But really inside the home was just full of abuse. My mom was abused. My mom was abused in a lot of ways from her first husband to the person she married, her insecurities and her fears kind of governed her life. And it helped me understand later on, it doesn't negate what she does. It doesn't make it right. She uh, felt guilty and wrong the rest of her whole life because of what I went through. But really, she was a victim in her own sense. And we were both lost in this pain from this person and people who would abuse us. Now, and you can share this because so whatever degree, again, whatever degree you like. So and how did that affect not just your childhood, but then your later years in life? Like how, what was the rest of your time? like? What was the rest of your life like after that? Well, sure. I think when anybody goes through trauma, major trauma, and when I wrote a book, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it called Forgiven the Nightmare. And I didn't call it Forgiven the Abuse because I say everybody has a nightmare. Everybody has a trauma. My trauma was child abuse. It was horrible. It was ugly. It was wrong. It was evil. But there are so many other kind of nightmares that want to overtake us, especially when we're young in those early development years. And they kind of shape our whole life. They kind of shape our mindset. They shape our plans. They shape our past. And I think a lot of times when somebody's been through a lot of trauma, they're always waiting for the other foot to drop. They're always waiting for the rejection to come. They're always waiting for the fear to show up. So, yeah, I think for a long time, even though the after uh, 14, when the abuse ended, and it was kind of two things. Why did it end at 14? Well, I got big enough to fight my attacker off. That's mm. the first thing that happened. I got large enough and strong enough. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to just just be a victim anymore. I'm going to I'm going to take my pound of flesh, if you would. But also, I found a family member. I found somebody who would believe me. I found somebody who would stick up for me with their power, their might, their influence, and their strength. So those two things that happened at the same time. So at 14, the physical abuse ended. I was no longer raped again. I was no longer beaten again. I But now I had the, those years that my abuser, he just lied to me. He stole from me. He you know just put so much poor evilness. Within my ears, he made me think of myself as so less of a person. But even though the abuse ended, his words were still echoing in me. I'd look in the mirror and I'd hate myself. I never thought I had any value. I thought I was the least important person on the world because this is what my abuser told me. They call it grooming, right? So even though I was groomed and the abuse ended, the lies that my abuser planted those seeds of mark your fat, you're stupid, you're dumb, you're a loser, no one will ever love you, God will always reject. All, all that stuff was still echoing in me. And I think when people go through trauma, even though the maybe the the event of the trauma ends, but the echoing of the trauma lasts. So since you kind of brought this up, touched on this, so what did that healing process from that look like for you? And feel free to fill in any of those gaps. I know you said it stopped it at age 14. So from 14 on, like, what did that healing process look like for you? What did the relationship with your family and friends look like for you? What took place after that? You know, I, I wish I could give you a really systematic ABC one, two, three answer, but it wasn't. I, I, that's, I wish it was. I'd write a, I'd write a bigger book. You know, <laughs> it was a series. It was a journey. It was events. It was one day after another. It's one step forward and two steps back. Sometimes it was Leave me alone. I don't want to deal with it today. And then other days saying, I need to get a hold of it. I think obviously the most significant thing I did is at 16 years old, uh, 15, the summer of my 15 year, 15, 16 years old, I was invited to church. You know, and there I found a youth group. It was the 80s. We all had mullets. We had jean jackets with patches on it. It was the law, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, I found a place. I found a place that I could be safe. I found a place that I could find peers. I found a place that accepted me. 
Uh, I had no church background. I didn't know what it meant to be saved or be delivered. I didn't know any of those things. But at 16 years old, Jesus Christ became my Lord and Savior. I said a sinner's prayer. Lord, come into my life and give me my sins. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I did, probably didn't even truly understand everything I was doing, but God did. And that was the first step on the journey to healing. Now, I don't want to I don't want to sugarcoat this and make this like a, you know, just, hey, I, I went to church, I prayed, and everything was perfect. No, it was just the beginning of me seeking truth, seeking love, and seeking hope. So when I say to you, forgiving the nightmare, that's, again, I call it forgiving because I'm still on the journey. There's still parts of me that say, okay, God, I got to give this to you today. God, I need to trust in you today. So it wasn't a one-time thing. I would say I would argue that first event of asking Christ to be my Savior began it. But again, uh, I would have to say I was close to 50 before I wrote the book. So there was many facets and turns and twists. What I had to learn was God loves me. And when I learned that God loved me, I started to love myself. Mm. And that started so, the healing. So was part of that healing forgiving your earthly father and forgiving your mother if needed? Like, where did that come into to the healing process for you? Sure. All those things were factors. Let me just back up a little bit and say, you know, when I started on my journey, I'm a young Christian, 16 mm -hmm. years old. I don't know which way's up. I come from this dysfunctional, broken family. I found a, a home at church. I found a culture, a community. But really, when I really started to seek God, dyslexic, not knowing how to read well. I didn't seek God for forgiveness. I didn't say, hey, God, I want to forgive everybody who broke me. I want to forgive everybody who led me down the wrong path. When I started to seek God, I would say, God, I want to know if you're real. I I've been deceived so many times. I've been manipulated. And God, if you're not real, then I don't want this. So my journey started by seeking God. And by seeking God, God brought me to forgiveness. So it wasn't like, hey, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to forgive the man who took a pound of flesh for seven years. I'm going to forgive my mom who neglected me. I'm going to forgive you know, my earthly father who walked out and abandoned me, my biological father. I'm not, you know, I did start there. I said, God, if you're real, then be real to me. Mm. And it was slow because I was ignorant. It was slow because I was stubborn. It was slow because I was afraid. But God was faithful. And in that journey, eventually, God would say, what, what, God would bring me to forgiveness. But again, I had to learn trust, and I had to learn love, and I had to learn faith. And as I learned those principles by trusting, loving God, God one day would say, hey, can you forgive your mom? Can you forgive your earthly, your, your biological father? And then can you forgive the man who abused you? And believe me, it wasn't a yes right away. It was like, okay, God, I need your help. Excuse me. It's not always easy to trust God when we can't trace God. If and meaning, Lord, I trust you, but I can't see everything that that you're doing. You know the end from the beginning, but I have to be able to trust you, even though I may not be able to trace every single thing you're about to do, because God works systematically, right? So He. Like I said, he knows the end from the beginning. So he is going to take you through this step by step. And I'm guilty of this. I've tried to jump up two steps and then fall back down because I'm I was stubborn and hard headed too, just like you were describing. And you and I talked about this before we we jumped on air in our phone call. And said so that's some of my story of it's like, you know, you want to go from one to five five and just and just be there. And it's like, no, this healing has to take place and has to happen. So what was it like for you in that moment where you did finally forgive your father? Was it just something you said in your heart? Was it face to face? Was it in person over the phone? Like, what did that actually look like? Well, my, my earthly father, my mm -hmm. biological father, I'll start there. Yeah. You know, I didn't know him growing up. I didn't know his name because unfortunately I was born from an affair. So my mom kind of kept that secret. She had an affair with a married man and the ugliness, and the scarlet letter and all that stuff. So, so I didn't really know him. I always wanted to know him. I fantasized, hey, maybe he's rich and powerful and wealthy, but you know, he wasn't. It was a regular joke. But you know, I think when I met my biological father, it was the right time in life. I was a little bit older. I was in my 40s, and I didn't need him to be daddy. 
You know, I was a father in my own right. I had uncles and brothers and, and people who were father figures in my life in a healthy way. So it was a good meeting because I didn't expect anything. I didn't come there saying, hey, I wasn't angry. I put my foot in my mouth enough times. Now, I never made a baby out of with a married woman or I only made babies with my wife. But uh, again, uh, you know, I didn't expect anything. So, you know, I just wanted to know. I want to know some health story. I just want to know what I looked like. I, I want to know, you know, where did he come from? Because that's where I came from. So we had a really core, uh, really nice relationship for a, for a few years that he eventually would pass. It was never daddy, son, but it was like, hey, how's the game? So it was nice. My mom, I wanted to forgive. You know, my mom, I said, Lord, help me forgive my mom. I know she failed. I know she was wrong. I know that it doesn't, all the pain that she went through doesn't justify what she allowed me to go through. But yet, uh, my mom was like my only relative, right? I, I, my father was gone. This, her husband abused me. Uh, and, and like my mother is it. So I wanted to forgive my mom. Now, I will say my mom felt guilty every day for the rest of her life. And somebody listening today say, well, she should. Maybe she should. That's between her and God. But she apologized to me every day for the rest of her life. It doesn't mean that I didn't have my healthy boundaries. I had my boundaries with my mom because you had to. She came from hurt and she hurt people, not because she was evil, because that's what she knew. So I had to have my healthy boundaries. But within those boundaries, within that system, I was able to forgive, able to love and have a relationship with my mom. Now, the man who abused me, I didn't want to forgive. When you said hell to me, mm -hmm. I believed hell was for his. Mm -hmm. When you said revenge, I said yes. I was a pastor. I went to Bible college. And yet still this one man, I would say, Lord, don't dare ask. Don't ask me to forgive this person who did so, so much to me, who stole not just my flesh, but stole my value, my security, my importance. He left me insecure and fearful. God, how could you dare, if you're a loving God, ask me to forgive him? You know, and that's where the journey of seeking God and not forgiveness. Because as I grew, as I sought God, as God became bigger in my life, and I know how big the abuse, I know how big the trauma, I know how big the nightmare is. This isn't something I'm just, it's not like somebody cut me off. This is a, I know how big those issues are. But as God became bigger in my life, I started to see through his lens, if you would, the word, the spirit, God's lens greater than I saw through my lens. So let me just put this in an analogy. When I was growing up a PBS, there was a guy named Bob Ross. He was a painter. And I used to love watching him come home from high school with a bowl of cereal. Wow, man, this guy's awesome. You know, happy little trees, had the afro, you know, the whole guy. And in a half hour, in my mind, he'd paint a masterpiece. He'd paint a stream, a cabin, some rocks, a mountain. But oftentimes, near the end of his painting, he'd put a tree right in the middle of it. Right in the middle, and I, you had to kind of look around it. He'd paint this beautiful scene, but right in the middle, he'd paint a tree. And what he was doing, he was changing the perspective of the viewer. He was taking the subject of the painting and pushing it back. So if he painted a cabin or a mountain or a, tr or a river, when he put the tree in the center of the, in the center of the painting, he was taking the subject and moving back. The viewer saw it further away. In Christ, in my prayer life, not my audible, this is my heart of hearts, he said, Mark, put the cross. Hmm. When you put the cross in front of the trauma, doesn't mean the trauma goes away, but it gives you a different perspective. So as I began to put the cross, as I began to put the grace of Jesus, as I began to put the love of God in front of those who trespass against me, those who hurt me, those who wounded me, I, it didn't make it perfect. It didn't make it but it made it easier because now I wasn't just seeing through my own revenge, my own lust of desire to, to have my own, my own way made, my, like send them to hell, Lord. But I started to see through the lens of God. And that made it easier, but not easy. <laughs> but it made it easier. And then eventually God would send me to my abuser's bedside. and He was struck with a disease. He lost most of his function. The only thing he had left uh, near the end was his tongue. And he was still abusing with his tongue as, as he did when I was young. 
Uh, so I went to the rehab center, the nursing home where they kept him. He was bedridden, unable to get out of bed. And there I went. And I said, you know, because Christ has forgiven me, I'm going to forgive you. Mm. And, and I was able to, now it wasn't this Cinderella moment where he cried and apologized. No, he was still spewing abuse as he always has. But I knew that's what God called me to do. I don't say God calls everybody to do that. But God called me to do. And in a sense, I wasn't really just speaking to my abuser. I was really speaking to fear that day. And I was telling my abuser, I forgive you because Christ forgives me. But in a sense, I was saying to fear because God accepts me. Fear, you have no more hold over me. Doesn't mean I never get scared or nervous. Of course not. But I was controlled by fear. And now fear doesn't control me. Uh, and so I did as God told me to do. And I forgave those who trespass against me. That's what I did because God called me to do that. But that was a journey of about 40 years in my life before I got there. <laughs> you know, the obedience is up to us. We have to be obedient to things that God called us to do. And the outcome and, and the results are entirely up to him because we can't control the response of someone else. That's right. We can control whether we're going to be obedient or not to the Lord. And it's why it's, a lot of times I pray, Lord, give me the grace to do the things you've asked me to do. Amen. Especially those tough things like forgiving and loving my enemies, because Amen. it's easy to love people who love us back. It's easy yeah. to love people who treat us good. It's easy to love people who treat us the way that we want or even we feel like we deserve to be treated. But they crucified Jesus and they crucified an innocent man. So what more can we expect to also be mistreated or in that case, not have that act of forgiveness returned or not have that love returned? We can't walk in with that expectation. We have to walk in with, I'm going to do the very thing that God has asked me to do, and I'm going to do that to the best of my ability. That's true. That's true. You know, I think one of the things that really helped me on my journey was to kind of get a concept of forgiveness. You know, I, I, I grew up saying, forgive and forget, right? That's how, kind of how we were taught. You know, let it go. Sticks and stones won't, you know, you know, don't hurt, you know, names don't hurt me, but sticks is, you know, the old, the old yeah. saying. And, and. You know, I had to kind of realize what forgiveness is, and forgiveness is and isn't. And, you know, forgiveness isn't a one-time event. You know, the Bible tells us his mercies are made new every morning. And, you know, I have to realize sometimes every day I have to get up and say, God, I put it back in your hands. God, my flesh doesn't want to do this. My, but, Lord, I trust you. I have faith that you'll help me today. Uh, forgiveness is not saying it's okay. You know, forgive, let me tell you, I would never say, a trauma like my abuse is okay. It's evil. It should be justice should be involved. The authority should be involved. You know, you know whatever that, you know, courts and, and that all should be involved. And just because I could say, you know what, I forgive you, I'm still going to press charges. I forgive you, but I'm still calling the cops. I can forgive you. I, the two things can live at the same place. Forgiveness, again, doesn't mean now I got to go have Christmas Christmas dinner with you. Forgiveness you know, I can have the boundaries as we talked about earlier. So there's a lot of principles I had to learn about forgiveness because I didn't, I said, Lord, how, if you love me, how can I ever forget that I was abused? You know, that's not intellectually honest with myself. I know what my body went through. I know what the stabs, the beatings and the lies and the blood that came down my body. I know that. But what it, what forgiveness helped me do is not let it become my identity. See, my abuse was my identity for far too long. and But God set me free from that. So, yeah, I was abused. I was beaten in ugliness. I've dealt with all the psychological and, and emotional things. I'm dealing with them just like anybody else. I didn't do it alone. I had friends and coaches and counselors and pastors that came alongside. But it's not my identity. It's not the anchor that hangs around my waist anymore. It's not the stern, like that's not the rudder that steers the ship. My abuse stored up my ship for so long, and now Christ has set me free. Oh, does it pop up its head? Yes, of course it does. Every day? Sometimes. You know, you know, some days are harder than others. I have my triggers, just like anybody else who's been through trauma. But that's when I go, God, you're bigger, and you're loving. and you're So, yeah, God's ways becomes higher. You know, God's ways become greater. And in that, when these things from the past stir up, I lean on the word of God. I lean on my prayers. I lean on the truth of God. And I remember I am no longer 
identified. I no longer allow myself to be identified by my worst moment. Now, hey, I got a lot of, <laughs> I put my foot in my mouth perfectly. I'm just human. But right. it's not the abuse that identifies me now. It's Jesus. And a lot of uh, some of the overlap of what you said is forgiveness sets you free that the enemy Amen. now can't hold you into that bondage or soul seeds of, of bitterness because he's always going to try to use guilt and shame and condemnation to keep you in that space so you can't be utilized by God the fullest of your potential. So right. the enemy is going to call us by our sin. The enemy is going to call us by our past, whether the enemy is going to call us by our mistakes or our shortcoming. God is going to call us by name. <laughs> God is going to call us his children. God is going to remind us that we're overcomers, that we're more than conquerors. And that's why it's important that I tell people we have to have the word written on the tablets of our heart. We have to have it in us and we have to have Amen. the scripture memorized because when those, when our identity comes under attack and it's going to happen, and we're reminded of that thing from yesterday, we have to be able to say, that's something that happened to me, that's not who I am. That may have been something I did, but that's not what I am anymore, because I know that's whose it. I am, and I know who has set me free from those things. Amen, amen. And we're not glossing over forgiveness or repentance or anything that may come along those steps. That's definitely not what either one of us are saying. It's a matter of, no, this is who, this is the identity that I have in Christ, and this is what he says about me. That's and, right. there's, and there's steps we're going to have to take, but this, I, I'm not where I was and I'm not who I am. So if it doesn't line up with scripture, we don't have to carry those identities and those falsehoods. That's right. That's right. You know, in that journey, like I say, that journey of forgiving the nightmare, whatever your nightmare is, mine was child abuse. And, uh, there's so many, you know, I don't even tend to know them all. Uh, but whatever that nightmare is, tried to trap you. And yet there may need to be a road of forgiveness, and grace, and dying to self, and, and, you know, just killing the old man, and, and picking up your cross, and renewing your mind, and allowing God's ways to become, you know, of course there's a process, you know, the process of sanctification, the process of growing closer to God, there's always a process, there's always a journey. But again, like you said, that worst mistake, that worst problem, that worst tragedy, that worst uh, you know, abuse does no matter what side you don't have to. That doesn't have to be your identity. Now you may have to pay a price for it, uh, but it doesn't have to be your identity. Your identity can be what God calls you to be: forgiven, set free, and made new. So I like what you said, brother. So how? Because I want to give you a little bit of time to to talk about the book before we get into the let them know segment. How hard was it to actually? write that book or was that a like that was a part of your healing process but what was that process like for you well you know it's funny it's a big story i talked a little bit about it in the book but here i was at bible college and they asked somebody to close the service i was on a traveling ministry team there's a miracle how i got on that we were up in canada big old church five thousand people like the biggest church i've ever been in and the director said would anybody come up and want to close the service I said, I, I got a testimony I'll share. The next thing you know, Reader's Digest version, I preached, and everybody's crying. And I thought I did something wrong. I'm like, man, did I, did I mess up here? You know what happened? So we open up the altar. That's kind of what we do in our faith tradition. We invite people to come to the altar. We pray with them. And so I looked to other people on the team. We were at the altar. And it was about nine of us on the team. And I looked to my left and my right. They got a few people with them. And then I look in front of me and there's a line I can't see the end of. Mm. And I'm a kid. You know, I'm 21, 22 years old. I don't know which way's up. And my knees are knocking and my hands are sweating. I'm saying, God, I am not the guy to be here. I am not the guy that, you know, I, I'm messed up in so many ways. And God started to speak to my heart there. And he said, Mark, you got a powerful testimony. And if you give it to me, I'll use it. I said, Lord, it's yours. And I, you know, this was like, it felt like an hour, but it was really two seconds in my head. And the Lord said, I said, Lord, what are you going to do with it? And he, he said, you're going to write it down. And I started to laugh because here's this dyslexic special ed student, small bus kind of kid. You know, I'm, I'm a little older in college because I'm so nervous and afraid of academics. I, you know, it was just a real difficult time for me. I said, Lord, I, I can barely write. How am I going to write a book? And so I started to laugh. And I said, Lord, if this is really, you know those prayers? If it's really you, Lord, prayers? Yes. I said, Lord, if it's really you, what am I going to call this book? 
And right there, when I was in my early 20s, it was called, he said, you're going to call it Forgiven the Nightmare. So here I am in my late 40s, and I'm literally writing the book Forgiving the Nightmare. So it wasn't like I left that altar. No, I got married. I had kids. I finished school. You know, I, I had, you know, I pastored churches. I was a staff pastor, a lead pastor. I went on mission trips. I made my mistakes. I, you know, I had to grow and mature. And, you know, so, a, you know, my, a good chunk of my life went by. And hopefully there's more, but a good chunk of my life went by. And, and then the Lord said, now you're ready. So, and when I put my pen to paper, it, it just kind of flowed out. It really it was like in there for all those years, a little bit mature mind, a little bit more sober mind, a little bit more tempered mind. So I wrote this story called Forgive the Nightmare. And really what I hope to say in it is, listen, if God could pull a guy like me out of the miry clay, if God could give me a hope and a promise, if God could deliver me and not let those things of the past control me, Hey, listen, if God can do it in me, I'm the least of them, believe me, and then God can do it in anyone. I'm the one he left the 99 for more than once. You know, it wasn't just one. He kept coming to get me. Uh, so if God can do it, so when I wrote it, it wasn't hard. I mean, there was, it was a, it, you know, it wasn't hard to put down the first draft, but then you get into editors and publishing, and boy, that was a education in itself. But but we were able to put it the you know pen to paper, and, and really my hope is uh, that people will find freedom. And God's opened a lot of doors. He, I've been on the Seven Hundred Club. I've been on several podcasts like yours. I've had opportunity to speak on this publicly. So God has just opened some great doors. And to hear the testimonies where people go, I got a story like yours, Pastor Mark, and I want the freedom. Well, I don't give up the freedom. God does. And really, my testimony is not my story. It's God's story through me. So whatever your nightmare is, I know God wants to come and deliver you. Because if he can deliver me, he can deliver anyone. So before I, I do have another thought that sure. just hit my head before we get in the let him know segment. So for anyone who's either been in, in the situation that you were in, when you're going through it right now, like what advice would you give to them? What would you say to that person who has experiences like yours? Well, I'd say you're not alone. You know, a lot of times the enemy or our flesh, you know, we isolate ourselves. We find ourselves self-medicating. Uh, if it's like me with Twinkies or something else in between, a bottle of smoke, I don't know. But we find ourselves self-medicating. And we find ourselves not really sharing this story, especially men, right? We keep it in. We don't tell anybody. And we kind of just feel like we're isolated. And we bury it and never talk about it. It's, you know, never bring it up. We try to hide it. We try to chase other things. But it always seems to pop up within us. And I'd say if you're going through trauma, now, obviously, if you're in it, somebody's abusing you right now, reach out for authorities, find help, find support. But if you're going through the, the process of living with it, trying to ignore it or trying to deal with it, just know you're not alone. And there's countless people who have been through what you've been through. And they're there for support. They're there to help. They're there to come beside you. There's so many resources. On my website, forgivingthenightmare.com, I have some links of resources where people could go and find some support, you know, and advocacy and just wisdom and literature of people who have walked through this. And, you know, because guess what? We think we're hiding it from some, everybody, but it's usually pouring out somewhere, usually on the people we love the most. So know you're not alone and know that Christ loves you and he dies for you and he's there to lead you through this. So you're not alone. God loves you and there's support out there. Amen. I don't believe how fast this, this episode has gone by. That brings us to the let them know segment. Thank you for, for being on the show today. Thank you for just your transparency, your encouragement. And I, I know this has touched the hearts of a number of, of our listeners today. So thank you for taking the time to, to do this. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you and your listeners. And it's just a blessing to be on the podcast. And may the Lord be glorified. Amen. This is the final segment of the show. This is the Let Them Know segment where you can share anything additional like with the audience. So my brother, please let them know. Let them know. Let them know. Well, I'll let you know I love Jesus. and Jesus loves you. And the biggest story I have is Christ loved me in my brokenness. God, Christ loved me in my 
ignorance. And I would say to anybody that where I was, there's hope, there's truth, there's love, and there's light. Call on the name of Jesus, no matter where you're at. I tell my church all the time, we don't live perfect lives. We serve a perfect God. We don't live perfect lives. We live forgiven lives. So know that God's there for you. And I'd love to be able to talk to you more about this and contact with you. I'd love for you to get the book. So if you want to know more about me and know more about our ministry, you can find us at ForgivingTheNightmare.com, ForgivingTheNightmare.com. The book is called Forgiving the Nightmare, and I'm on all the social medias that my kids tell me to be on. I think I'm on X and I'm on Instagram and Facebook and, and several in between. So you can look us up and we'd love to connect with you. Send me an email. Send me a text. Let me know what God's doing in your life so I can pray with you and go before you. So you know, my biggest story is Jesus. And that's really where it begins and ends. I weeped on Jesus. I celebrated with Jesus. I was afraid and I ran to Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. And even though my life was filled of torment, pain, and sorrow, only because of God have I found hope and peace in the midst of my battle. And I want to see others set free. So check us out, ForgivingTheNightmare.com. You can also find the book on Amazon. Check it out, ForgivingTheNightmare. So wherever you may be listening to this podcast, out of you type for giving the nightmare in the comments. So the first five people are going to get that book in your hands. So I'm going to buy a few copies of that from you for the audience. So thank you for, for sharing that. We're going to share all of your links to make it easy for, for folks to find you as well. So thank you so much again, brother. I love what you do. Thank, thank you for you. being a voice. Thank you for being a witness. Thank you for allowing other people to come and share their stories to lift up the name of Jesus. And man, glory to God for that. Because like you and I discussed, it was not always this way for either one of us. So we, he takes all, I give him all the credit for that. So if you would not mind close this out in prayer, brother, I would really appreciate it. Thank you for doing the show again. This has been a huge blessing. We got to get you back on. And next time you come to Cleveland, uh, lunch is on me. So please, oh, man. I think I'm free tomorrow. So we might be able to make that work out. <laughs> no, 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 I'll text you on the way. <laughs> That'll work. Lord, I thank you, Lord God, for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your love and your truth, Lord. And Father, I pray for anybody who's listening to this story that deals with trauma, Lord. Father, trauma of any sort that has stole from them the value, their hope, their light. Lord God, I pray that you come gently but truthfully to them, Lord God. I pray the gentle hands of God begins to be the lifter of their heads. I pray, Lord God, that you just begin to speak love where hate was once screamed. Lord, I begin, I pray you begin to heal, Lord God, that inner part of the man, Lord God, so we can say, as the psalmist said, all that's within me, all that's within me, Lord God. So, Lord, I pray today that people find hope and not phoniness. I pray today they find truth and not deception. Lord, I pray today that you set those people free in Jesus' name. May they come to know you, come to know you and as, to, as your as Lord and Savior. Lord, bless them and touch them. Be with them. Thank you for our, our friend today. We thank you for this podcast. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And Lord, I just thank you. I just thank you for this day, Father. I thank you for the fact that you saw fit to wake us up today. So you have a plan and a purpose for each one of our lives today, Father. So I just pray that you just give people visions and dreams and they just write down those visions and those dreams, Father. That they begin to write that book. They begin to start that TV show. That they begin to to take steps towards that podcast, to take steps towards that radio show, Lord, to open up that store, to to create that business, whatever it is you're putting on the person's heart who's listening, Father. I pray you just stir them up and get excited for where you're taking them, Lord. So I thank you for healing that you're bringing to anyone, Lord. I thank you that their trauma will be will be healed and then a part of their testimony is they can help other people heal, Lord. So I thank you now for everything that you're doing in us and through each one of us. And we just give you all the credit, all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Mark, thank you so much for being on the show today. We are looking forward to having you back on. Thank you again for having me. God bless. God bless.